Uh, I'm Ted, and uh, most of you guys have been here before, and uh, you know our format. Um, the idea is we want to get some information from our guest. If you guys have questions for us, please put them in the chat thread. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions. As you know, we run on donations. So if you like what you see, if you like what you've seen in the past, please donate to TAPS. Um, it's how we fund our TAPS LA Music Festival, which is June 12th through 26th. And we hope you'll apply. Um, our guest is a member of the Kansas City Symphony. I think he's probably the youngest member of the Kansas City Symphony. Um, his name is David Yoon. David, welcome to TAPS Q&A. How are you, man? Great, Ted. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, again, sorry for the delay. Um, I apparently don't know how to use computers. Uh, my Zoom on my computer would not allow me to have audio, so I'm on my cell phone. Um, but it's all good. Uh, what's the weather like in Kansas City today, David? It's weird, man. It's like, it's like I don't know, 40, but like it had, there was a snowstorm yesterday in the evening, like hailstorm in the morning. It was like hot the day before. So <laughs> it's just like all over the place right now. So, and you're, you're a Southern California guy, so this is all really weird for you, right? I guess, yeah. I mean, I was, I've been in New York for school for like five years and then to here, so I'm used to it by now. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to talk about your, your New York experience, but, um, tell us first about what life was like in, you grew up in Orange County, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you from Irvine? Yeah. Did you study with Rob Slack? No, I mean, I, I like, I was in PSYO, so I did like all the side-by-sides with him. Um, and I have some great memories doing that, but I studied with the guy, Nick Terry. I don't know if you know him, he's a Chapman. Sure. Yeah, I studied with him in like middle school. And then I ended up going to Colburn and studying with Jack um, for like three years before college. That's right. That, that was as part of the academy program, right? Yeah, I did one year in that. And then we kind of were like, we just realized uh, maybe it was just kind of a, a long commute to do the, all the other stuff they wanted me to do. So I ended up just doing lessons with him. And then he was really nice. He let me kind of go to the Tuesday night studio class with the college kids. And so oh, that no was way. like amazing for me. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Uh, for those of you that don't understand what we're talking about here, Orange County is in Southern California. It's south of Los Angeles. The Colburn School is in Los Angeles. David, while he was in high school, was coming to study with Jack Van Geem, who's the former principal percussionist of the San Francisco Symphony. Everybody's still with me here. So that's a pretty amazing education. And then seeing the college kids at Colburn play and probably, did you play for them in this class? Yeah, we did like, he just like basically like included me in the class. So whatever they were doing, I got to participate in. So like, whether that was like, you know, sectionals on like an orchestra piece or just like marimba class or whatever, I kind of got to just participate. And I mean, yeah, it was kind of, um, it was amazing for me because I just felt so lucky to be there. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I like, I feel like it's worth having you say a couple words about Jack Van Geem because he's uh, of the generation that would not have posted on social media about his exploits and like the things that he was doing, uh, but but my yeah. uh, uh, not to not to bait you here, but my ex my small experiences with Jack were that he is one of the more intelligent people on the planet, and like really dedicated to music and really cares about music. And I imagine that was a pretty incredible mentor for you as a as a high schooler. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, he kind of he was very. I don't know, he kind of opened up like a whole new way of thinking about music that I was just, yeah, it was just kind of crazy to study with him. And um, he was like really smart. He, uh, like he actually wanted to become a doctor, you know, yeah. like originally he went to medical school and all that. And so he was like very smart with just in terms of like technique and re relaxation and all that. And yeah, he was more than anything, what I gained from him was kind of just, like he was just so passionate and generous with music. And I think it, when you're in that, at that age, you know, it's less about like getting all this technique and this and that, it's really more about just like finding the passion. So he was uh, kind of really good for that. Yeah. 
Um, tell us about your, so you, we know that you started studying with Jack while you were in high school. How did you, how did you get into music? Are your parents musical? What, what were your, what were your beginnings? Like? Yeah. Um, so I did start off when I was really little, a couple of years in piano and then quit. Um, and then I, I started taking drum lessons with, uh, this like Korean church guy that my parents knew. And, um, do we call him Korean church guy? Is that his official name? <laughs> well, like, I'm just trying to think about like what kind of like genre of drummer he was. He was kind of like a gospel, like he played really big and like always laid it down. Yeah. And uh, so I just, it's like, you know, gospel church style drums. And, and I remember like one Hold of on. like- Sorry, I, I just need to understand this. Is, was he Korean? Yeah. So Korean, yeah. so I don't go to church, but Korean, there's like Korean gospel church. Like that's- a <laughs> No, no. Well, he was just like, no, he went, like, he was part of some, like, Korean church, but, like, he just played, like, in the band. They wasn't, like, they played any specific, like, Korean genre music or anything. It's just... But they did, but they did like, gospel type stuff. Yeah, well, he played, well, I don't know, but he played with that kind of gospel style, you know, drumming. Um, I knew I would learn something. And, yeah. And yeah. he, uh, I remember he, uh, I used to be, like, really sensitive, and he would, uh, we like he would have me play this um John Mayer track I remember Vultures and it's um it's Steve Jordan playing and he's just like laying it down like four on the floor like no fills and uh he wanted me to do that like you know just work on this for the week don't play any fills like play absolutely in the pocket and um I was so sensitive that he would if he would say in my lesson like oh you're rushing you know you're getting ahead of the song like I would <laughs> I would start to like tear up or something a little bit, like just involuntarily, because like I'm, and I'd be like, "Why are you so soft? Like, why, why, why am I getting like this?" But I was just so, I don't know. I guess I wanted to do well, and I was sensitive. But um, that's what I remember from Jay. It's like the the drum teacher um, playing yeah. vultures to John Mayer. That's so wild. Yeah, I, yeah. it's funny because my, my first teacher was also like the, the drum set lessons were kind of my favorite part. And I think you get some really um, important seminal training to being an orchestral percussionist from playing rock and jazz and, and just laying down this simplest of grooves. Yeah, definitely. And then I did, I did violin um, in fourth grade when like the string program opened up, did that for a couple of years and then joined the percussion thing and uh yeah and then st started studying with nick terry at chapman he's a you know college professor for a couple of years and then studied with jack and then through that in high school i also played kept the drum thing going i played in the, the jazz band at school which was like i, I think that was really important for me to keep doing mm -hmm. that so are um, your, par your parents musicians not professionals um my well my aunt though is uh organist she went to juilliard she went there for like 13 years or something she has like a pre-college degree undergrad masters eight eighty uh -huh. so she's an organist um i found out she was in the class with joe gramley wow okay yeah so but, but obviously your, your, par your parents um recognized that you had if not recognized that you had talent they recognized that you had interest and that you were going to work at it but they probably recognize both right yeah i think so um I, I don't think they really knew what they were um getting themselves into it's kind of like they were coming along with me and i had these experiences that were you know affirming like you know whatever i got into the juilliard percussion seminar like that was in 2011 and that was a big moment where it was like oh like wow he he got into something that was big and then i did these summer festivals and um so yeah, they were like, they were very supportive of it because they, they knew how much, you know, fun I had doing it. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, what, what do they, I'm, you said they're not professional, but like, what do they play? Uh, they don't play anything, but my, my dad, my, my dad's a doctor and my mom um, was a dentist. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, so then, so then from the Juilliard percussion seminar, that is that how you kind of decided that you might go to Juilliard for for college yeah that was that that kind of uh planted the seed I, I went in 2011 and I was really lucky because I went I, I had just finished my freshman year and that group just so happened to be me and I think like 
pretty much everyone else, almost everyone else was finishing their junior year. So it was people older than me. And we got there and everyone else was better than me. And I had never seen people like that good. You know, I remember yeah. seeing just like, uh, yeah, all sorts of people there. Like who was there? Um, John Ringer was there. I don't know if you know, Will McVeigh, Marcelina, Will Champion, just like a bunch of great players and um, people I still keep in touch with today. And I, I got there and I was like, oh, this is like, this is crazy. And um, so that was kind of the first like major spark for me. When you, when you see that, I mean, obviously it's probably kind of intimidating, but it's probably inspiring also because you're like, wait a second, I want to be like these people. I like what they're doing. I want to play that well. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, I don't think I was so much intimidated because I was younger. So like, I, I just felt like I had this cushion. I didn't have to be as good. Yeah. But um, so it was, it was just a good situation for me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you go to, so you go to Juilliard and did you study with Danny? I studied for, with Marcus for the first two years and then Dan with the, my last two years. Okay. Please tell me what you learned at Juilliard because I, you know, I have envy. I, I never got to go. Um, yeah. So I don't I know what you learn there, but I know that you learn stuff. Because lots of great people come out of there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, I don't know how to summarize it in just, you know, <laughs> in words, but it's just the whole experience of being there and just drawing from everything around you, you know? Yeah. Um, what yeah, I, what you, I, you know, from it, so, sorry, David, what I, what I see, what I see, cause, cause I'm going to get to the point that <clears throat> I've got all the David Yoon disciples studying with me now at the Colburn school. So we're going to get to that in a moment, but um, don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll hit you. <laughs> okay. One on. okay. But what I, what I see from a Juilliard graduate that goes through undergraduate there is they've got, a really comprehensive musical training in which they understand music theory and history. And they've had some good experiences playing in ensembles, not only large ensembles, but also chamber stuff. And I, I get the impression that Danny Druckmann puts all of his undergraduates kind of through the shows them the ropes in terms of playing like difficult contemporary percussion music. Yeah, definitely. It's a good, that's a good way to put it. I mean, it's a really well-rounded school. Like, in in every sense i mean from like the academic as aspect to new music chamber music orchestra and um you know specifically the percussion studio you're going to have players who have different specialties people who want to become chamber musicians orchestra players and you know you're going to learn so much from your studio mates there as you you know you should in any studio um, yeah you know I, I think probably like i learned at least half of i mean at least half of why I got better while I was there was due to the players around me, you know? Right. Did you, did you know that you wanted to be a, a symphony musician? Was that sort of in, in hanging out with people like Jack Van Geem as a high schooler, did it become evident to you that this was like a, a career path or were you still working on just being a percussionist? Yeah. Um, less so with Jack because he, he didn't seem to push the orchestra thing or anything like that. He was kind of just, it was just like, I don't know, music with him. And yeah. he didn't, he, it didn't seem like that was necessarily his passion at, at that age, you know, at that point in his career. Yeah. Um, he was, I remember he really enjoyed teaching me marimba and like working on Bach. Um, and, but I, I went to this, um, the main thing that did it was I went to this uh, program NYO and it's a, you know, summer festival for high schoolers. And that was kind of the big thing where I was like, oh, this is like really cool to play in like an awesome orchestra, work with great conductors. And it was more just the, I knew that that was, could be a stable path if you, if you were able to win a gig, that it's just, it's just something that you, you could do. Yeah, I, I find it to be one of the, one of the stranger things um, in terms of what was happening at Colburn, because Jack, musician and being a great orchestra musician it didn't seem like he was prioritizing that for for his students but every single one of them was thinking about music deeply and I think you you've had this great combination of teachers and training in which you clearly have a love for music that's beyond playing you know four stroke roughs on snare drum in the orchestra and so <laughs> I feel like it's one of the great things about your training 
is that you've had these these role models that are musicians first and orchestra musicians second. And I'm thinking about Jack and I'm also thinking about Danny Druckmann, who is clearly a deep musician. He just happens to play percussion in the New York Philharmonic. So I feel like that has to be have an impact on you as a musician. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's funny that you you mentioned that because like I I also my, my friends know this. I have a I generally have a pretty hard time like coming back to like orchestra excerpts and things like that. I'm not, I mean, I, I admire people who can stay really excited about that and you know really keep those things in their hands and continuously work on them. People like, you know, one of one of my big influences, Matt Strauss. And mm -hmm. he's someone who I, I think like just loves that stuff and like you know that's awesome you know but it's it's a lot harder for me to to even want to go anywhere near those things yeah well it's yeah. a it's a you won your job early so you don't have to deal with that anymore right well <laughs> I, I i it could be <laughs> yeah except for the yeah. fact that i happen to know that you are still competitive uh, in national editions and and i imagine you're going to keep going hey what what are the biggest takeaways from working with Danny Druckmann, why are his students so successful and, and what do you get from him? Mm, yeah, Dan is very, um, he's very, it's never good enough with Dan. So that's one of the first things you're, you're held to an extremely high standard. So, you know, you're never going to play something for him where he's going to just say it's good enough or something like that. You, you just, you know, he's, he's, he's so critical and it can be frustrating sometimes as a student, but he's so concerned about every sound you make and he never tells you exactly how to fix something. You know, he's never going to be like, this is how you do it. You know, so like you really, if you're a successful student of Dan, you really have to do a lot of exploring, you know, to, to figure things out. So mm -hmm. if you, and if you, if you do that, then, you know, you're probably going to learn a lot from, you know, having to figure figure out how to make good sounds, how to play relaxed, you know, all those things. Yeah, I've, I've heard that, I've heard people say about Danny that sometimes people say, yeah, it took me a little while to figure out what he was looking for and what he was asking for. Um, I think, it, I imagine what that means is that he essentially acqui uh, requires that you're a deep thinker, that you learn to think about how to, how to process what he's saying and how to absorb it and turn it into something. Yeah, definitely. And and also one of the one of the things that he's that it just comes with, you know, being around him, absorbing his energy, seeing him, seeing the way he plays in like the New York New Music Ensemble and deals with these like ridiculous setups and having to do these big percussion ensemble things with him is you, you really learn how to, you know, move very stealthily and build really good setups and play chamber music and be very, I don't know just be able to kind of handle those things. So in, in orchestra, for example, like if pieces come up where you're doing a movie score or whatever and some complex percussion thing, it's it's usually nothing. I mean, compared to, you know, the, the level of criticism that, you know, that you're under under with Dan. Uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, and, and it's like clear that, you know, hearing you say that, it's like, there's really no big difference between playing a piece of new music with six other players and playing a movie score where you're you're in this big setup, the difference is that you've got a conductor and you've got you know eighty people in front of you instead of you know four or five, but yeah, you still have I mean, to set up right. Yeah, it's just it's just usually a lot you know a lot easier when you're playing an orchestra and you have the click track or whatever you know. I know. Yeah. Well, that's that's the beauty of of playing the orchestra. In the end, once you you kind of know how to play chamber music. It, it really guides you as to how to play in the orchestra, right? I mean, it's, it's all about listening, right? Definitely, yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't know if I, I drew on that necessarily, but, you know, definitely those chamber music skills are, you know, what makes a good, you know, percussion in terms of playing in the group and learning how to play a good placement, that sort of thing. Yeah. Hey, how did you, so you got your job in Kansas City, in the Kansas City Symphony, only like a year after you graduated <laughs> Juilliard and you were at Manhattan School of Music. Am I correct? Yeah. So I was started MSM in September and then the audition was in January. That's outrageous. By the way, how old are you, David? 25. So January of 2019 or 20? Oh, man. 
2019, I think. Okay, so yeah. I think doing, doing my math, uh, that means you've been there for three years and a month, right? Yeah, this is my third season, yeah. Third season, okay. So how did you balance the new music and stuff with your orchestral pursuits at Juilliard in order to be ready to win a job a year out of Juilliard? How did you do that? Did you go to class? <laughs> Someone set you up with this one. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I've, uh, man, I was always one of the worst like students, at, at, especially at MSM. Cause like, you know, and I, I always tell my friends who are still in school and stuff. I'm like, guys, there's no rush. Like, you know, just enjoy this. Like you're never going to be able to take these weekly lessons with these great teachers and be in this environment. Like you don't, don't need to, I mean, I get it. Cause I was like, even by senior year of Juilliard, I was like, Oh, if I don't want a job, I'm, I'm screwed, you know, or whatever. And, um, but yeah, at MSM, I remember like, yeah, I did go to class and like I, they had, they had the registrar system set up so bad that like you could drop stuff without even like talking to someone. So I dropped yeah. like these ma mandatory classes <laughs> and um, I showed up to one class one time, like, and the teacher like did not know who I was. It was like the seventh class. I showed up like once and uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I, I mean, the reason I wasn't going though is because I was like, you know, like I needed every minute to practice or whatever, you know? Yeah. You, you were really focused and you join a lineage of successful orchestra player, orchestral percussionists, including Mike Warner, who didn't go to class and had people write his paper. Um, yeah. he, he'll, he'll, he'll let you know about that. Um, Vadim Karpinos, who I think also was, was going to have a tough time graduating from Juilliard, but he just so happened to win Chicago Symphony. So he was okay. You were in your master's at MSM and you win Kansas City and you go, see ya, I'm, I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah basically, yeah. I mean, I, at that point, I, I mean, the rest of that semester was really great actually, because I just took lessons, did percussion stuff with you know all those great teachers, and but I didn't have to go to class or anything, so yeah. that was awesome. That yeah. is great. So we're, we're here with David Yoon, and uh, I, I, I need to mention that we're giving away some really cool stuff tonight. Um, the Honorable Harrison is with us. Uh, Harrison, what are we giving away tonight? This. So Dragonfly gave us a nice little care package of David's stuff. I mean, David could tell you what we're doing, the ebonite and the three-quarter inch fiberglass and the kick drum beater and the suspended cymbal mod, right? I think so, yeah. That sounds good. What is this stuff any good, David? I, I've never heard of the dragonfly. What, what is dragon? What is dragonfly? Is <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I like this stuff. The uh, the the ebonite, the one inch um, xylophone mallet is just like a really good small, you know, small headed thing for. It's good for like exotic bird stuff. And then the um, the Glock mallet, the tiny head one is. I don't know. I guess that's a theme. I like the dragonfly is kind of nimble nimble yep. Alex um and then the, his kick drum beaters that he just came out with are, are really cool they're they feel really good they're, they've got a lot of depth and punch I don't know if you've tried them out it's it's a, the 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 kick drum the the uh, drum set uh yeah beater yeah nice yeah I have seen those and I haven't tried them yet but they look really cool yeah they look they buy them yeah they look really cool and um, they sound really good it's like very and the weight of the beater is really good. So like you can get, you know, good double action or whatever. So do you still play, you still play kit? Yeah, I practice it. I practice it still. And um, Josh and I kind of, we go back and forth. We both play in the orchestra. Very cool. That would be Josh Jones of the Kansas City yeah. Symphony. So, okay, thank you. Just for all those that, you know, are not. not oh, yeah. Know. Yeah, hey, yeah. Uh, so we, we have lots of questions for you. Uh, folks want to know what it's like to study with Chris Lamb and then talking a little bit about Danny and about Marcus and how's it, how's it different? And um, what, what's the, the degree at Manhattan school like studying with Chris, obviously you weren't there for the full time, but obviously it's different from, from Juilliard. Can you, can you uh, help, help us with that? Yeah. Um, well, studying, yeah. Studying with Chris is awesome. I mean, he's, he's, one of the one of the best percussionists out there, you know, teachers and players. 
And uh, I actually think that going to Juilliard and MSM, it kind of education is really complemented each other. You know, there's enough crossover with this kind of whatever New York school of thought. And um, it, it ended up working really nicely. But, um, you know, I mean, one of the main differences is Chris is a little bit more hands-on than Dan. And there's a little bit more of a kind of built-in curriculum and you're going to do this and, you know, reach these checkpoints in your playing and, you know, play like, you know, I mean, with Chris, you, you're, you know, you're forced to play like mountains of repertoire for him. You do these classes, you learn all these xylophone solos, snare drum etudes, and um, that's awesome, you know? And uh, he's really, I don't know, he's kind of like a, a perfect balance of teaching, you know, from a technical standpoint and a musical standpoint, he really brings them both together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and it's not just Chris too, you know, you study with um, Duncan Patton, who, you know, is the former timpanist of the Met, and he has, a, I think he's a phenomenal timpani, te timpani teacher because timpani is such a confusing instrument and he has like a system. And so when you have a system to go off of, that can be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically it's, it's not, I mean, it's, I, I understand that Chris is incredible, but it's not just Chris. It's, it's the combination of the teachers at Manhattan school. And obviously you're going to combine that with your training from Danny and those people are pretty different. All of those, all of those people are very different. And their style of teaching is very different and it's yeah. great to see how they, they each work for you. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, you're going to get different, you know, yeah, I mean, all the personalities of teachers I've had have been very different from Jack, who's kind of like, you know, this like caring, you know, kind of father-like kind of person. And yeah, you know, they're, they're all different. And I think the, um, they call it team teaching at MSM. And so it's like, I think that works great, honestly, because it can be, feel a little, especially when you do lessons like every week with the same person. For me, that always felt like rush. I feel like every week I'm like, you know, talking to my friends like before my dad lesson like oh my god like what am I gonna play like uh, <laughs> you know like, yeah. freak, like it, I just remember it was so classic to like decide like the morning before your lesson like okay I guess I'm gonna play this <laughs> and um you know you're practicing hard but like you just like these, these teachers they have such you know you 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 hold them so highly and you, you don't want to let them down and so like you, you're kind of fearful to play things that are just like subpar and you know some, you, a lot of times you have to I mean I constantly have it you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to bring this in like 75% tempo or whatever. Right. And at a certain point, like you just stop sugarcoating it. Cause like, you know, you're always, it's always a work in progress. And yeah. Um, but I, there was always that fear, but with MSM, it's like, you see every teacher you know, once a month or whatever. So it's like, yeah. you can, if you're, you know, organized, you can kind of plan out to how to be, you know, really prepared to maximize things. Right. So, um, one thing I've noticed about you Juilliard guys is I think you put a lot of pressure on yourselves. So I, here at Colburn in downtown Los Angeles, um, I like to call it Juilliard West because now we've had, uh, we've, I think in the last five years, we've had, or four years, we've had four Juilliard undergrads who've ended up coming here. And um, I absolutely love it. And I'll tell you why. Um, each student that comes here has, as I mentioned, an incredible uh, broad-based musical training. Uh, they have a real, um, they have an ability to learn stuff quickly because Danny has put them through learning this crazy percussion ensemble rep. Um, they've played in orchestra already. Um, they, in a lot of cases, they just need some guidance as to how the orchestral excerpts go because I, I, I don't want to disparage Danny in any way because his training is great, but it doesn't seem like from what you're describing that he says, okay, it goes like this, play it like this. You have to figure it out yourself. But because you guys are already quick thinkers and you're analytical, when you, when you get the concept, it's like you're off and running. So you've got these guys that were at Juilliard while you were there, that are now at Colburn, Toby Grace and Ben Cornavaca. And from what I understand, a bird told me that they just like followed you around wherever you went because <laughs> you were kind of the man. Um, so what was it that you were doing? I mean, we know you're a cool guy, but what were you doing that they were like, I want to be just like David? 
it's funny um we were we were hanging out all the time i mean like the hang was always when i was there was it's just like a big family you know it's great um you know i don't know at, at juilliard you just i mean like probably anywhere but I, this happened to me when i was a young you know when i was in my first year there you kind of you know hopefully there's someone older than you that's playing at a really high level that you can look up to and just try to latch on and so i remember there was players like that for me um when i came in when i was young and so when i was a senior that's when toby and those guys kind of showed up and you know i guess maybe they just <laughs> they looked up to my playing hopefully and so we you know it was uh that's how that happened i guess yeah no i, and, I, I that too as an undergrad and I actually think that that's that's one of the big strengths of a program like Juilliard is that um you guys are each influenced by each other and inspired by each other I mean that's that's critical yeah there's also this funny thing with like what you know you mentioned sometimes they, they people come in and post Juilliard and they still don't have necessarily the clearest picture on how the excerpts go because you know Dan's not necessarily one to teach it in a way that's like this is how you do it for auditions or you know however so there there have been phases where like people will just follow suit you know for whoever the best player is and like that player will be playing a certain excerpt a certain way but it could be like like not how it goes or it's just not <laughs> how it works and like i remember there was a a phase it was like my sophomore year like the whole studio was playing the schumann threes out of them part like like completely triple atized like, just to make it like easier with no back. It's just, and we were like, oh, we can get away with this because like, you know, it's a jazz symphony and it's the jazz notation. And like, we, people would go to auditions and play it like that. And like, we would do it in like, before, you know, in our mock audition at Juilliard and play it like that. And it's, it's funny how those things can happen. Everyone's just kind of following suit, you know? It's like a game of telephone and everyone's just kind of like, like following that message. Yeah. Yeah. But like, that's what we all did. I remember it's like, there will be like a, a phase where like everyone's like obsessed with playing excerpts like really slow because like you want to sound like mature and stuff and like to the point where it's like, like you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's a it's an absolute joy to to work with with these guys and I know that you guys are all have all been feeding each other's energy and these guys got a lot a lot from you. Um, it seems like you spent a lot of time going to concerts while you were in New York. Um, tell us about that. Was, was that like the New York Phil or the Metropolitan Opera or what did you go see? Yeah, I, that was like, that, I mean, that was one of the best parts of being there, especially when you're at Lincoln Center. I mean, um, yeah, I, I would try to go to the Philharmonic New York Phil like every week, you know, I, I would at least, cause like you could just stub in as a student, like you can just kind of show up and, you know, wait, you know, people would leave after the concerto. And like, I was fine with skipping that anyway. I want to go see like the big symphony or whatever. And um, so, yeah, I was constantly bouncing around between New York Phil and the Met. And uh, actually before the, the year started, one of my good friends, Omar, he, he just like would buy like the whole Carnegie. He got like a, a student discount thing and he would buy like two tickets to like every single guest orchestra that would come in. So like, I saw like, every single German orchestra and the BSO, all these the Philly orchestra that would come into Carnegie. And I would just, go to all those shows and it was like you know amazing yeah i i think that's that is really important um it feels to me like the the biggest weakness of a young student a young musician percussionist or musician is that they just haven't had enough time to experience all this music so obviously listening is really important then when you go to the the symphony and see these people doing it that's that's pretty inspiring too and i heard you just like at the at the end of the act, you'd go down to the pit and stand there and go like, "Man, you guys sound amazing," and just hang out. Yeah, I mean, like especially when um, you know, like Stephen White and I were were good friends before he won the Met audition, and then like next thing I know, he won, and it's like okay, like now I'm going to the pit and like saying hi to Stephen in it, and you know, I knew Greg uh, Zuber at that point well because he had, I'd been to Verbier and he was the coach out there, and so yeah, it was just good times all around. I mean, I, I that those are some of my important memories is like going to see the Boston Symphony. When I was going to school in Boston and it's like you pretty much should be a fanboy. You pretty much should be like looking at these people going, that's amazing. And I want to do that. I mean, that's that's probably a big component of 
what inspires you to take auditions without that you're kind of going what am i what am i working towards right definitely i mean it's like and also seeing like luckily being in new york you get to see like some of the you know greatest orchestras and um it's I, we actually like I, I would often debate with my friends that you wouldn't even be about percussion we would be talking about like oh we like we would be such nerds about it we'd be talking about like oh i really like the string sound of this orchestra or, like in the case of the bso like i always love the sound of the, the the trumpet section and i forget his name tom and yeah. like just this the pointiness of the sound was so unique and like i would you know we would go with non-percussionists and it was just we would get to you know just kind of chat about it and, and you know learn from other people about it and that was you know, so inspirational just to, just to love it. And, you know, yeah. 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 I, I, I feel like if there's the biggest takeaway for, for young people that are in this, this meeting tonight is, I mean, this is a really common thread and I'm, I'm hearing this from talking for, to you, talking to people like Tim Adam, who basically said they went and saw the orchestra as often as they possibly could. Uh, and that's the, that's, probably the best way that you can understand what it is to be an orchestral musician and to learn the repertoire and how to play it yeah i mean especially if you're in a, a major city that has a, a great orchestra and you know nowadays it's like all, all these orchestras are, are so good you know good, like good enough at least to, to gain this inspiration and it's like if you're a student and, <laughs> and you don't want to be going to these concerts then it's like oh I, I don't know like you you're doomed you know yeah you know, hopefully you yeah, hopefully you want to go because that's what you want to do. And if that's not what you want to do, you can go to some other concerts with for something that you want to do, you know? Yeah, that I think that's such an important component because when you see people that are doing the audition circuit, you're not sure if they're really into it for the musical reasons. That's usually a red flag. And I think that's that's an important distinction. This is this to me is what I thought of before our interview is like probably most people go, Oh, he's, you know, David's just kind of a savant and he can, you know, because he's so gifted, he was able to win a job at, at uh, 22 or 23. Uh, but I, basically what you're explaining is that a lot goes into that and we haven't even gotten to the practice part. So tell us yeah. about, tell us about like, what was your, what was your routine like and what kind of stuff were you doing? Obviously we, we kind of know, you know, practicing Corgi, what that might be like, but Maybe give us some things that might have been unique to your practice style that that would help us to understand, you know, what you were doing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not it's it's not true. I'm not a savant, and um, my my close <laughs> friends know that I I I constantly, I mean, like I constantly uh, don't say that about myself. I you know, it, it's like you have to just work really hard if you want to get there, you know, and, and it's so much more about that. And, you know, we've, I think at this point, we've, we've learned a lot about that. And a lot of the pros are saying, saying those things. And there's all these books out there you can read about that. But um, yeah, in terms of practicing, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember before I won my job, I mean, I, it was the first time that I had approached a list where I was, really actually ready to take the audition i've so many times before um compartmentalized like you know whatever uh just worked too much on snare drum or xylophone or whatever and neglected accessories this and that i mean like i showed up to the met opera audition my junior year because it was across the street and like the pre i remember <laughs> in the prelim they put um a bass from etude and like I, I straight up did not look at it like i i learned the etude that morning and that's like i don't even think that's that crazy i'm sure other people would do stuff like that too um but when i won my job it was the first time i sort of like really practiced evenly and like it was like everything was going like this you know instead of like like get this to like 100 percent and then bring this up so um and what goes along with that is kind of tackling your weaknesses you know stop practicing the things that you're good at I struggle with that a lot because at, at Juilliard you you're thrown in front of your peers so many times where you have to perform in front of other people and you you know there's this big pressure to, to sound good and play well so like you don't want to sometimes you want to avoid the things that you're bad at um, but the quicker you can get over that and just benefit more from working on the stuff you're bad at it's just it's just better <laughs> yeah and and I think that that people sometimes forget that I think what a committee is looking for is just a comprehensive musician. And 
if you can demonstrate it on xylophone and then you can't demonstrate it on tambourine, that's potentially a red flag for them. So yeah, yeah. oftentimes people get fixated on the instruments that they kind of know or feel like they've got to go to, like, like the mallet instruments or snare drum. And then, I mean, we, we were just talking about it with the St. Louis audition. I think that that committee is really looking for someone that can play timpani and that can play excerpts and yeah, sure, mallets, but they only asked one mallet excerpt. And now they're actually scrutinizing your triangle playing and your bass drum playing, which is a big part of playing in the orchestra, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, yeah, you just have to be really well-rounded and be able to learn, you know, learn all the instruments. And it's, it's hard. That's why it's hard for percussionists to, to win jobs early because there's all these instruments you have to figure out. And it's like, it's, there's never enough time, you know? But you're telling me that Kansas City was the first audition where you felt like it was all kind of a rising tide in terms of you learning the list and you were doing it in a comprehensive manner. Yeah, it was, it was really the first time I, I like went into an audition with, with a lot of confidence. And I, it's weird because it also, the confidence comes with waves of like, I remember like even like three days before the audition, like kind of like breaking down. And I, um, I was working so hard, you know, I was getting there at seven in the morning, leaving at 10 PM and, you know, I mean, whatever, going out for food, this and that, but like, I was working like harder than I ever had before. And there would be days leading up to the audition where I would get there like at seven and like leave at like 11 a.m. just like defeated because I, I I just felt so overwhelmed and it's just such a emotional journey everyone who knows who I mean unless you're a savant <laughs> you know winning and auditioning all the, the heart and soul you have to pour into it is just so it takes it out of you you know but um yeah I mean I don't even know where I'm going with this <laughs> well I was I, that's funny I well it's not funny at all because I I went through that too and I was going to ask you um you know, because I, I think that there are people that might be uh, deluded into thinking like, well, the, the people that succeed, they just love practicing. And I think that uh, just like training or, uh, you know, like an athlete's training, there's got to be days that are just painful. And I think you just kind of described one where yeah. you kind of are wondering if, if you're doing anything right, if you're doing anything right, uh, and if it's all worth it. And um, I certainly went through those days, too. Um, how do you how do you overcome that, and how do you you turn that into a positive experience in the moment you know of the audition with the pressure of the audition? Yeah, I mean in the in the moment it's hard, you know, but you, I mean you have to just. I, I guess you 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 for me I kind of look at the the immediate goal, which is the audition, and say you know it's almost over, just just keep going, and you just try to tough it out. And for personally, I, I just I think I think about like how how lucky I am to be doing this and. It's just drums. What's the big deal at the end of the day? Those kind of things. Just give yourself, you know, some perspective, a reality check. But ultimately, you know, win or lose, you're going to leave that audition feeling a lot better about yourself and gaining a lot from the whole experience, you know, especially when you take yourself to new levels and stuff. I mean, there's nothing better than that. And ultimately, that's that's what that's what, what matters in the end. You know, it's like you, you get lucky to win a job, but, you know, as long as you do all the work, all the good work and keep getting better and better, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll reach that point at one, you know, at one audition. Right. That's great advice for, from someone who took like three auditions and won their third one. How many auditions did you take? At that point I took, I think that was my sixth audition. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I took a lot of auditions and I, I shouldn't have been there, you know, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of remember what I was trying to say earlier about the, the confidence thing. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was just the first time that, that I actually felt confident going to audition that I was like, oh, I mean, I'm getting all these affirmations from my teachers that I actually could win this. And it's every other audition before that had kind of been like Hail Mary, like, yeah, like, just like, you know, hit, hit it and hope. Yeah, just like. <laughs> and like I remember before Omaha I had I, um my Joe, Dest Joe Destel was in here and I remember I had I called Joe Destel the night before I showed up to the Omaha principal audition and I was like Joe I was like man like just tell me to cancel this flight like I, I don't want to go tomorrow like I'm not I'm not even ready to play this audition like he's like oh just go you like paid for the ticket and like sure enough I got cut you know yeah yeah 
but isn't that funny that that uh, I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, people are going to a, a small regional audition and they go, oh, this one will be easy. Uh, but then, in fact, you get you get cut there and then you win Kansas City. It's really all about you, you have to go through the same preparation and you have to be truly prepared for any job you're going to win. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and also like you, you just. I think probably what hurts the most is you know, undermining an audition and, and, you know, if it's a regional thing and then like doing bad in it, that would, that would be painful. So, you know, you want to like give it the respect and give it the preparation. I mean, sometimes it's, you learn from taking auditions too. There's different schools of thought in terms of like, take as many auditions as possible or wait till you're ready. But, um, you know, you just want to make sure that you gain from all your experiences, you know, loss and wins and all those things. Yeah. I'd love to hear about your audition um, because I, I suspect, you know, just talking to you, there's something that people call like a flow state where when you're playing music, you get to a place where it's not left brain, it's not analytical, it's just in the flow. Uh, I know that my best playing in auditions was when I could get there. Uh, I'm wondering about your your experience and how Kansas City was different from your five previous auditions. Like, did you get to a place in the finals where you're like, yeah, I kind of, I got this, or they're digging me, or I feel really good about what I'm delivering. And if I like it, somebody else likes it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I remember when I did the prelim, I I've always been like really scared of prelims. I always feel like that's maybe it's just a mental thing, but I always feel like it's it feels like the biggest crapshoot to me. You're given like the smallest time period. I think it's probably the round where the mistakes are most, you know, they're most um, they're not as forgiven because there's so many people we have to listen to. So I, I remember I, I played the prelim and was like, oh, I, I thought I played good, but I guess I could get cut, you know. And I got through and I was like, okay, here we go. And I remember also that that prelim round was kind of, I feel like some of my weaker excerpts on the list. And so I figured, okay, like now I'm in good shape. Like I'm most likely not going to play those things again. And then, um, yeah, I mean, each round you, I, I, you gain confidence. I, I think that probably happens to everybody. It's like, you just start to feel more comfortable on stage. And yeah, I really did reach a, unique flow state at that audition where I was playing the rounds and they were long rounds and I'm so upset like I didn't like record it like they were really they took my phone away and like <laughs> I considered I considered bringing like a burner phone and like just like <laughs> giving them this because it's like I, I don't care like I'm going to record the audition even though you say I'm not going to but it, it, it's just the heat of the moment I didn't record it and I'm so mad about it but um <laughs> yeah I remember reaching this this flow state in the round that was yeah, I mean, it was like unique to me for sure. I mean, because usually I, I, I like to think a lot when I play and, I, you know, I, I'm very careful with what things are going through my head while I play. I like to decide those things, but it almost felt like I was in a Zen state. Yeah. And David, how do you think I feel, man? It's been like, it's been like 23 years since I won my first job in Chicago and my I really think that my first job in Chicago was really the only time I was in that state for a long period of time. Like, cause I, cause for me, you know, you can get there and it's, but it's about sustaining it and, and doing it over a 45 minute round and doing the Danny Druckmann thing, like moving seamlessly to the next instrument and staying in that flow. And when I finished that round, I, I, I looked at the proctor who took me off stage and I was just like, how long was I out there? Was that, that was about 15 minutes. Right. And he's like, no, you were out there for almost an hour, you know? And he's like, how do you feel? And I was like, I have no idea what just happened, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah, uh, it's, yeah. I so, I so wish, I so wish that I, I had that recorded. I mean, obviously that was in the dark ages. So we didn't have like cell phones or anything, to, you know, video phones, but I would so love to see that because I think everyone's reaching for that moment where you're in that, that state and when you can do it in that moment and and end up winning a job it's like that's that's everything yeah i mean i think one thing that has to come to be able to create that kind of moment is you have to you have to be as as prepared as, as you ever are going to be you know you have to bring your best 
your best version of yourself and you have to be really confident like you just have to be um because when you're playing around and you're playing an audition it's not the time to to be to i don't know it's not the, when you're on stage it's not the time to show humility to anyone else it's time to to be the guy you know <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. How how is the uh, how is the experience playing in the orchestra different from winning the job? Um, it's a lot different. I mean, there's it, it, they're two different things for sure. It's, um, but um, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, it's uh, they're, yeah, they're just two different scales. But I'm lucky that I had all these great you know training orchestras I played in and college groups that it, it was an easy transition yeah what what other kinds of stuff do you do in Kansas City obviously you're not just coming home from rehearsal and studying scores you, you're doing other stuff what 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 are some of your hobbies like what's some of the stuff you're doing I've never been to Kansas City so I'd love to know like what's what's happening there yeah um hobbies I mean I uh I like to run um I, I feel like that's that's really important for me like uh, in terms of mental health and stuff i if um it, you know I, I that's something i need to do on every audition day on anything important i mean it's not even on on those days just like in general if i skip a day of running that's kind of it becomes a dud of a day yeah um yeah so running i love to eat just <laughs> hang, hang out with friends and yeah watch movies just normal stuff you know all right so you're kind of yeah. just a normal guy but we we've learned that you're kind of a sensitive guy too. And if your time is rushing or dragging, someone tells you, you might tear up. Yeah. I, I think that was kind of, it must've been beat out of me or something because that's actually why I, funny enough with that, like crying story, how I was tearing up in my drum lesson for rushing, like, like such a little <laughs> wimp. Um, my last violin lesson, I studied with this uh, really intense Chinese teacher. I mean, like, like hardcore and my last my last lesson with him ended up with me like hysterically crying like 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 heaving and like I was so embarrassed about it like my mom's in the corner like just like oh my God. yeah yeah because <laughs> like I don't even think he was being that it wasn't even a big deal he was just a little like disappointed or whatever you know because like I wasn't practicing and it's unfortunate but that's how like my last lesson ended but um I think going to New York kind of like hardened me and so I don't know. I, I don't yeah. think it's, a, I don't think it's a big deal anymore. No. And, and, and I think it's something I, I, I happen to think it's something to embrace. I mean, I, I can think of, you know, I think, I think most people have a childhood story like that where it's like, boy, uh, that, that seems embarrassing, but I think there's something to be said for sensitivity when it comes to being a musician. And it's obviously that's, that's the way that you're going to be able to relate to, 85 or 90 other people on stage and make music with them. Like, I think the, the biggest thing is, is having empathy and being sensitive. So obviously that's a, that's a big part of your playing. And it'd be easy to miss that as a young percussionist. Cause it's like, everyone's going like, got to chop out, you know, got to, got to, yeah. and, and I think yeah. like you're demonstrating something that that's critical of, of musicians. It's like, you, you do have to be sensitive and, and you have to love music and, and be sensitive to it. Definitely. I mean, sensitive in, in many ways, you know, musical sensitivity and collegial sensitivity and just all sorts in all sorts of ways, for sure. Oh, yeah, we could we could write a book about like working with with colleagues and, and how to do that. And uh, obviously, you've got another what? I don't know, 30 years to, to deal with that. That's that's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. It, it, I guess it's a challenge, but it's, I mean, like, I guess it probably comes with any work environment, but yeah, it's that, that's one thing that's, it's different. You know, it's like now you're, you're working with colleagues and you're not just working with, you know, all friends or all or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Yeah. yeah the, the, the hardest thing for me was, was that you go from going to say a Tanglewood or uh, we met at, at Texas music festival and like all the fellows are the same age. And, uh, and then you get into the orchestra and then, it's like three generations. Like there's people old enough to be your grandfather, people old enough to be your parents, and then people that are older than you, and then a couple people. And obviously you're one of the youngest. When I started in the orchestra, I was like the youngest. And then you you grow up, but it's weird at yeah. first. 
talking to people that are like older than your grandparents. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, and percussion, you you really get the the best view of you really percussion. Like you see everybody. Yeah, and you you could see all the little the little vibes or the jabs or or whatever. Like, um, but yeah, it's it's there's such a wide group of people there. You know, from young to old and happy to sad. <laughs> I know, I know. And and yeah. you kind of stay above the fray of those those folks that are like not digging their job. And let's face it, in every workplace, you know, there's two out of ten people that are not like totally digging it. So definitely. Yeah. I mean and and you know, orchestras I guess it could be, you know, tough for some people and you know, you just I would just say I mean, at school and orchestra and anything, you just surround yourself with the people who, who bring the positivity, you know, don't, don't bring yourself down with the, the negative, negative dudes. <laughs> hey, what do you think about, uh, what do you think about like the, um, I don't what, what do we call these people? Influencers that are, like doing per, like lots of percussion videos. Um, I per, speaking personally, sometimes when I go on Facebook and I scroll down, I get depressed because I'm like, Oh, that person's in Hawaii. That person's like playing with this orchestra. That person's doing this. And I'm just like, sitting around today doing nothing is that is that something like what do you say to young people who are like they look at it and like i get really inspired and then i get kind of bummed out like i don't think i can ever do it what do you say yeah i mean that's tough i mean personally i i'm not i don't get sad by it i don't think you know i actually like really i like i really enjoy seeing people i know like what they're up to and it's it's kind of fun but i i know that's a that's a thing that happens to a lot of people um yeah, I don't know. It's it's just a complicated thing, this whole social media thing. And I know it, it can be very toxic for, for people to see all those things and think that, oh, I, I can never be that. But, you know, you, you can be that. So, I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. And also, yeah. I mean, obviously, what people what people post is not it's not it's, and it's not all the truth, you know, so just because right. someone posts a picture of them smiling doesn't mean they're, you know, in good it spirits. Doesn't, it doesn't mean they're happy. Right. Yeah. So. Don't what take it your, too seriously, you know? Yeah, that's that's good yeah. advice. So here's a question. What are your goals as a musician now? Goals. Um, I guess now that I've, I've been in the, the job for a couple of years and things are easy and life is good, I, I would say that uh, it's a goal of mine to just keep going, you know, to, to not get complacent and to keep loving it and to find new, new ways to challenge myself and keep getting better that's great uh a very important question uh i think the others were from instagram so thank you to everyone for their questions this one is uh, an important question from greg larosa pizza in new york city traviata or 72nd 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 what and why 72nd it's just better so it's crisper, cleaner, smoother. <laughs> smoother. Yeah. It sounds so delicious. I, you know, I really resented when I got to Chicago and Chicagoans would be like, oh, if you're from New York, well, you should try our pizza. It's so much better. And I, and I was just going, man, it's not even the same thing. Like you guys make this weird cheesy pie. You know, you might as well put apples or strawberries in there. Like pizza in New York is a different vibe altogether, you know? Ted, I went to um, I went to Lou Malnati's during the pandemic, um, mm. and I had it like to go, like because you couldn't go in, and brought it home, and it, like I, it must have been like a bad day because it was it was bad. It was like this thick piece of bread with like a frozen sausage on top. It was it was weird. It was really weird. Oh man, hey, if Greg LaRose is in the room, I really hope that you'll agree with me that David Yoon needs to go to Wayno Sushi in Torrance, California. That place, you, I, I just have a feeling you, you would like it. The service. Oh, Wayno. Wayno, yeah. That's like a train station, I think, in, in Tokyo or something. But, oh, okay. Yeah. But my, yeah, uh, yeah. My, my grandparents live in Torrance, actually, so uh, well, I'll go check it out. <laughs> well, you, you, you got to let me know when you, when you get over here. We, got, we have yeah. a question from Josh Jones. Josh Jones in the house. Hey, Josh. Where did you learn to play cymbals so great and so consistent? Thanks, Josh. <laughs> um, I, I've become the, the cymbal player in Kansas City. I'm always playing cymbals, I feel like. Um, cool. 
and, and uh, I love plug symbols. Um, but uh, I think it, it first started with just a desire to be good at symbols. You know, when you're when you're a Juilliard, it's or anywhere. But like when you're an undergrad, it seems that like no one knows how to play symbols, and it's like okay, the obvious thing is let me see if I can get good at this thing that no one can play. And so it's just something that I explored a lot. And then I was lucky enough to, you know, go to TMF with you and Matt for two summers. And I think my, my first summer there, like Matt and I did like this, like, we just like, he was so like inspiring. And I, I just did like these crazy symbol sessions with him. And I remember like, it was ridiculous. I was like practicing symbols for like two hours a day, which is like, and I, I, I it's, it, it kind of led to actually me having this like permanent, like crack in my arm, I think. Oh man. But um, don't do what I, Matt Rouse tells you to do, man. He'll he'll take you down a rabbit hole. You can't do that. Yeah, but that that was the first thing that really helped me because he kind of had this, you know, analytical approach and sort of like method to do play these like really ridiculous like pieces of metal that it's like what what that can be so frustrating. Yeah. So it was the first time I could like just have these variables like explore the angles, like the point of impact, how long they touch each other. Um, so that was the first thing that really helped. And then I would say the, ne ne the next main thing was studying with Chris at MSM. And he's a, like, in my opinion, one of the best symbol players. He's got a, he's got a different approach to, to uh, symbols than Matt. And yet they, they both work in different ways, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, very different symbol players, but that, that's just, you know, more information to draw. And ultimately you're going to, as you know, it's one of those instruments that, you have to find your own way to do it. And everyone's got a different way. I was just going to say that it's like, you, you know, you, you look at 10 different professionals and they all play symbols, the, the attack, the point of contact and, and the, the upstroke beforehand, it's always slightly different. And yet people figure out their own way to do it. It's kind of like a baseball swing, you know? Yeah, definitely. And it, it's just so happens that like, even like the way I play, like, I, I don't, I don't like the way how it looks, but like, it works for me. So I just got to keep doing it. You know, um, I, I can't wait to hear it. I, I can't wait to hear you and you and Josh play together in Kansas city. Uh, I, I, I just need to do a world tour, man. Uh, or get on the yep. sub list. Is there a sub list audition? Can I take the sub list audition? Just, just send him a text. I'm sure we can get you out. Oh, is it that easy? Oh, that's good. Yeah. I like. Well, I like yeah, we all, our orchestra is really good about letting us kind of bring whoever. So, if you want to come play, come play. <laughs> right on, man. I knew yeah. we had meetings for a reason. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Apps, for providing me with a substitute opportunity with the Kansas City Symphony. It all happened right here. You saw it. Um, hey, I think we got to give away some mallets now. This is this is cool. These are some of David Yoon's go to mallets and um i gotta say i i am so impressed with dinesh's products and i just love boutique makers like dinesh uh, at dragonfly it's like some of the best stuff and he's a player and he understands what we need and obviously you get that david so i think this is amazing thank you to dragonfly for donating this equipment and this is some of david yoon's uh go to gear that somebody's going to be winning when Harrison spins the wheel. All right, everybody. This is why you're here. Thank you, Dinesh. Are yeah, Dinesh is a great guy. Yeah. Makes awesome stuff. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Oh, here comes the wheel. Oh, this is this is big. Place to spin. Pretty small, pretty small group here. You're all holding a decent. Percentage. Wow, the, their odds are pretty good. It seems. Yeah, yeah. And just wait a and second, Joe Desital. No, he can't. He can't win it. He he doesn't yeah, that, percussion anymore. That guy, that guy can't win. Yeah, he's he he's win, right. Why, why not? No. Nah. Oh no. Wait. Okay, good. good Will good. Will McVeigh. Will McVeigh. He has a job. He doesn't need this gear. Off. Is that wait, a doesn't Joe have a job? Is I mean, New World, right? Yeah, we can't give it to Joe's Joe. Joe's in New World, and and Parker Meek. I mean, that guy. We've been talking about Juilliard, yeah. and I mean. No, he he's got all these, all these resources. He doesn't need those mallets. Yeah, do you want I could go on. on. I could I could I could off? roast everyone here. Yeah, it seems like pretty much like fifty percent of this this spin is like we could just absolutely roast all these people. It absolutely. <laughs> you know, rather rather than do that, let's give them the opportunity to win. It's 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 pretty exciting. So 
You ready to spin it, Harry? Yeah, yeah. And if Will McVay wins, we'll just put his phone number out there and everybody can call him and complain. Oh, we'll, we'll give him hell. Perfect. Good luck, Will. Good luck, Will. You that's like him. when... Um... That's like when Joe Kelly won the uh, Luft giveaway. I don't know if you you were you yeah, saw that. We talked about that on his cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> like winning Joe Kelly winning a thousand dollars of Luft Malance. Outrageous. Right. Here we go. I know that's funny. <laughs> oh, we're just flaming everybody right now. Are we spinning? Oh. Oh my. Oh, it's oh Leo. my god. It's Leo. Ted. Ted, do you know Leo? You know what? I don't. I don't know Leo, but uh, Leo, I've heard a lot about you. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, most of it's really good. So, Leo, I know you're, go you're going to use these mallets in good health. So, congratulations to you, Leo. You better not own any of this stuff. And if you do, you should donate it to some homeless person who's taking up percussion somewhere in New York, because I know... You're at, I think, I think Leo's at MSM, right? Yeah, he's, he's, he did the Juilliard MSM, the MSM thing, and he's, he's a broke college kid, so he, he could use it. <laughs> he can use it. All right, well, then yeah. this worked out really well. Congratulations. David, it is great to talk to you. This is great information and great to get to know you better. I only was at TMF for a couple of days when, when you were there, but uh, I saw you play a concert and I have to remember what you were playing a ridiculous Tom Tom part. Was that, uh, help me out on the piece. LA Variations. That's right, that was the Stalinin. Yeah, awesome piece. Cool, very cool piece. Yeah, you, yeah. you and I was, I was really impressed and I thought, yep, he'll get a job. Oh, I remember you came to that. Uh, thanks Ted, I appreciate that. You came to the sectional and everyone's like, oh, Ted's gonna be so chill, it's like, great hand great guy but like i remember like no one like learned the part and you came and you were like guys like what the hell is going on like like why why did you guys learn this i'm, like, <laughs> I'm just so chill until i'm not no i mean you're chill but like how could you be chill in that scenario i don't blame you you know so well it's 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 funny it's it's sometimes i think everybody needs like a lesson in like you got to get prepared for this stuff you got you got to take it seriously i you know who gave that to me Danny Druckmann mm -hmm. at Tank on his dad's piece, Jake, uh, Jacob Druckmann's Come Round. He schooled my ass. Like it was 45 minutes of like points to the thing in the score and goes, no. Yeah. And then yeah. he tells me how to do it. And man, that was probably the best lesson I've ever had. Yeah. I'm sure you're all the better for it, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. I can take all the credit for you winning your, your career. So you're welcome. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Ted. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, David, it is really great to talk to you. And uh, you've had a really impressive start to your career. But I know that it's it's going places from here. And I wish you continued success. And, man, I sure hope I see you in the future. When you come to visit your grandparents, hit me up, please. Will do, Ted. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you to you. Thank you to everyone for attending and um, stay tuned. We have more to come and uh, check out our website for information on the TAPS LA Music Festival. We have a concert on the USS Iowa Battleship, which is a super cool spot in San Pedro. We're doing Music for 18 Musicians by Steve Reich. Uh, we hope you'll join us for it. Uh, thanks to everybody. Congratulations, Leo Simon. Unbelievable. Everybody have a good night. David, see you soon, man. All right. See you, Ted. Thank you. Good night, everybody.